Uh, all right, buenos dias, mis amigos. Let me read this for you before we get started. Proverbs 3, verse 32 through 35. For the fraud is abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he blesses the habitation of the just. Surely he scorns the scorners, but he gives grace unto the lowly. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the promotion of fools. All right, so there's a clear difference between the saved and the unsaved. All right, and there's coming a judgment day in that is when the Lord Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. It's the end of the world. The unsaved should be concerned. Because the end of the world is coming. <laughs> and if they don't get saved today... When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it will be too late. Those of us that are saved, we've got nothing to be anxious about. All right, and so I want to go over this video here titled, What Antichrist Will Do in Israel is Shocking. Bible Prophecy by Dr. David Jeremiah. Now let's listen to what they have to say. There are 25 different titles That's for right. Antichrist That's in right. Revelation. 25. 25. He's called the man of sin, the lawless one. You can just go right through it. And um, all of these titles are meant to give us a little glimpse into his character, his personality. He is the most wicked, most uh, awful person. I mean, take Hitler and Stalin and... Um, Mao Zedong and all those yeah. people, wrap them all up to one and then... Yeah, so he's going to be, what he says, he's going to be the most wicked person. Yeah, and worse than Stalin and Hitler. And, well, what's the Bible say? Well, yeah, the, what's interesting here is he's referring to the book of Daniel. Let's start here. Let's just read a couple of these on our way to Daniel. Let's read a couple of these here. Um, let's see. For Where am I at here? For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. They speak vanity. Every one with his neighbor with flattering lips. And with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things. Now we're seeing examples here that the evil people aren't the ones that are speaking boldly, but rather the ones that are speaking with the flattering lips and flattering tongues. You know, flattering lips. They they flatter with their words. They don't speak bold as what this guy is implying. Okay? I hope that makes sense for you. Now, let's keep going here. Oh, well, let's see here. A lying tongue hates those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth works ruins. I mean, so there's so many examples here. Lots and lots of examples. Now, in Daniel chapter 11, speaking of the Antichrist, it says, And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, oh, to whom they shall not 
give the honor of the kingdom. But he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. So he's going to obtain this fourth kingdom of Daniel. Now, anybody that has read the, the book of Daniel ought to know that Daniel prophesies of four beasts until the end of the world. And the four beasts are represented by a king and his kingdom. So there will be four kingdoms until the end of the world. And then comes the fifth kingdom, which is the everlasting kingdom of our God. All right, now, if you've read this book, you ought to know there's the first three kingdoms have already been named by Daniel. The first kingdom being the Babylonian Empire, the second king or the second beast is the Medes and the Persian empires, and then the third beast is the Greek Empire. And the fourth beast is not mentioned, but we can conclude that the fourth kingdom has to be the Roman Empire. Because when Jesus comes along, the Romans are in charge. And we read in Luke chapter 2 that... The Caesar decrees that the whole world should be taxed. Now, <laughs> he can only be, he's only able to do this if he is the fourth beast. All right? So the Caesar Augustus, Roman emperor. Now, it's important to understand that. The fourth kingdom is not just one man, and then it's over. If that were so, then we would be in this fifth kingdom of the everlasting kingdom, and that and this world would be destroyed. That has not happened. All right. So I, I don't want to get too much into this, but. Daniel's very clear about this. All right. Now, let's see where we at here. Oh, I forgot where I'm at. In Daniel 12, verse 2, it says, Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. This is... What happens at the end of the world? It is appointed unto man once to die, and then after this, the judgment. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. This has not happened yet. Therefore, the fourth king has to still be in power. And well, you might say, well, Caesar is... He died a long time ago. Well, if we read Revelation 17, for example, or we could just use common sense, either way, we know that there is a succession of kings being spoken of in regards to the fourth beast, the fourth kingdom. And that would be the same really is the first, second, third. That it's not about one person. It's about the kingdom. Okay, in Revelation 17 it says there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and, an, and the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. This is a clear reference to a succession of kings all right so understanding all that then we ought to know that we are definitely without a doubt 
in this fourth kingdom and this fourth kingdom will be destroyed when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. Now, this guy, he's making it out as though there's another kingdom coming and it's evil, pure evil and wickedness. Now, what I want you to do is to think of what he's saying not as um, the bad guy, uh, what we perceive as the bad guys coming in and taking over the world, but rather view Jesus Christ as the bad guy. Okay, because that's exactly what he's saying. He's making Jesus Christ out to be the bad guy. So when he's talking about Hitler and Stalin and all the evil and wicked, he's talking about Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, he disguises it. He's not honest. He's full of lies, and he can't tell the truth, but that's what he's implying, and I'm going to show it to you. Multiply him, and you won't even come close to the awful uh, character of this man and he's going to gain control of this world and now remember he's talking about our Lord Jesus Christ he's being deceptive and very subtle but that this is exactly who he's talking about watch everyone will be under his domination because if they aren't they won't be able to function so David our audience curiosity my curiosity is um where does this man come from? What can you tell us about us about him based on biblical revelation? Right. I believe he comes out of the European coalition. The Bible said... I believe he comes out of the European coalition. That's not supported by the Bible at all. Notice he's, he's not sure. I believe, I think, I don't know, I'm going to make something up here and just pretend like I know what I'm talking about. He doesn't know. It says that early in his... In his uh, career, he takes power over three nations, and then with those three nations, he gets power over the European coalition, and then ultimately... Okay, so th that's just ridiculous. He, what he's referring to... is, again, in the book of Daniel. And let's go... To Daniel 7 and it says and the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise and another shall rise after them and he shall be diverse from the first and he shall subdue three kings all right so this is what he's referring to now If we scroll down here, here, yeah, I'm going to have to play this, uh, let this play out. But this is in reference to the fourth kingdom. All right, so whatever, whatever he's trying to sell, it don't buy it. It doesn't, he, I don't know what he's talking about. I don't, he knows, he doesn't know what he's talking about. What he's implying is that there's going to come some guy and he's going to subdue three kings in the future from right now. As though this hasn't already happened. See, he doesn't know the scripture. He wants to apply this to something that's going to happen in the future. Therefore, he can make the case against our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I'll just watch. Ultimately, he comes to power over all the world. And uh, when we talk about the false prophet in a few moments, you'll learn that his, his uh, strategy for gaining control of the world is to provide a license for everybody to basically be alive. Uh, we call it the mark of the beast. But basically, this license was set up to control the economy of the world. And, and the, way, the way you qualified to be able to eat and sell and buy and all of that was... To uh, so, uh, again, clearly, 
uh, ignorant of spiritual things that are written of in the Bible and in particular in Revelation 13 where it talks about the mark of the beast it is a spiritual mark just as we will be marked when Jesus comes and marked and lifted up and gathered up and then will the angels be at, allowed to pour their vials of the wrath of God upon the earth okay I mean uh, you got to be willingly stupid in my opinion to think these foolish thoughts okay so in 1st Corinthians chapter 2 the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God all right so these guys they don't know the truth at all they see everything in naturalistic terms because they do not know the Spirit of God now <laughs> this should also be a clue when somebody you know is blatantly lying and they are promoting this idea that people are going to get microchipped or whatever in their forehead if they're openly promoting that there's you know you might want to question why you'd want to agree with these people that don't know God at all was to worship the beast who is the Antichrist the beast from the sea and so there that's where we get the mark of the beast and, and uh, he he gain, gains control over all the world here's the key thing that he does he makes a covenant with Israel at the beginning of his career and he promises to protect them from all of their Arabic enemies and and and, and so Israel goes back home and they they kind of disarm they use all of their inventiveness and try to rebuild their economy and the Bible says while they're at peace he comes in and he breaks the covenant that he had made with them. So the peace treaty is is is, is negated. And at the end of three and a half years, he comes in and he violates their temple. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Okay, so uh, it's unbelievable. It really is. So he's referring to Daniel nine. Let me, okay, so let me walk you through this here. We have to get down to the bottom here. All right, so the, let's kind of, I don't know, work backwards or randomly or whatever. So the three and a half, what he calls years, is in reference to verse 27, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease now this guy here he takes that and flips it around so now he doesn't confirm the covenant he breaks the covenant and it's not for three and a half days rather three and a half years now, this is exactly what he's talking about even though he probably not smart enough to be able to tell you exactly where he's getting this doctrine from but this is exactly the specific spot in the Bible that he's getting it from so then comes the question who confirms the covenant with many for one week and then in the midst of the week he caused the sacrifice and oblation to cease and then at the end of the week he rose from the dead until the time until the consummation right which is the return of our Lord Jesus Christ when we shall have been received up into glory up into the clouds with him when we are changed from mortal to immortal and then the world comes to an end when the wrath of God pours upon the whole earth and as we read for example in 
2 Peter chapter 3. See, I really like this one here because it's crystal clear. You can't get around this. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, he will come as a thief in the night in which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate those without the spirit of god this here is talking about our lord jesus christ and what this guy is making Jesus Christ our Lord out to be as he's making him out to be the bad guy. Now, it's to me it, uh, rather amazing that so many people are teaching that our Lord Jesus is the bad guy here um, at, in Daniel 9. Okay, this Daniel 9 is not talking about the bad guy. He's talking about our Lord Jesus Christ, and he's the good guy. Seventy weeks are determined upon the people and upon the whole, thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins. Now, you have to be out of your mind to claim that the Antichrist is going to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal off the vision of prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. You have to be stupid. I mean, there's really no other word to put it. This is dumb to suggest that Daniel 9 is in reference to the Antichrist. This is clearly speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ and he has already fulfilled us. Now remember what he said. Uh, what was that last phrase about the temple? Peace. He comes in and he breaks the covenant that he had made with them. So the peace treaty is, 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 is negated. And at it's the end over. of three and a half years he comes in and he violates their temple. And he violates their temple. See this, that's violates their temple. Now, this is incredible, really. If you go to, I'm working a little bit sideways and backwards perhaps, but in John chapter 2, he, there's a great conversation being taken place here. Let's, let's get the context of it. In 46 years, was this temple and building and wilt thou rear it up in three days you know because jesus says destroy this temple and in three days i will raise it up he tore down this temple which is our body and he rebuilt it and he ascended to heaven and promised to return for us. And when he returns, we will be changed into this new rebuilt body. This new rebuilt temple that our Lord Jesus has made for us. That's what this is talking about. In Daniel 9. All right, verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, three score, and two weeks, and the street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. Now the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. What Jesus was referring to is rebuilding our body unto the holy city which is above all right i mean you can't get around this you cannot get around this in galatians chapter 4 jerusalem which is above is free 
which is the mother of us all. So we're all being uh, rebuilt for this new city that is in heaven, not on earth. All right, so when Jesus comes, we can lift up our heads and know that our redemption draws nigh. So when this happens, then we are transformed into our glorified bodies. We will take off this corruptible body and put on incorruption. We'll take off mortal and put on immortality. That's what this is referring to, and there's no wiggle room about it. If you don't understand it, that's not the Bible's fault, that's not God's fault, that's your fault. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. Now this is obviously in reference to the 70 weeks, which uh, started when Daniel was uh, pondering the 70 years. In reference to, uh, obviously, uh, Jeremiah the prophet. So we go to verse 26. And after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. See, Jesus died, not for himself, but for you and I. For whosoever believes in him, he died for the whole world. That through him we might have life. He does not lay down his life for himself, but he lays down his life for his friends. And the people of the prince shall come destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one. This is clearly referring to the Messiah. I mean, we this Messiah... You know, the Messiah, the Prince, you know, um, I, you, <laughs> it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable how somebody could look at this and get it completely wrong. But then again, isn't this the way it's supposed to be? I mean, even today, when Moses is read... The veil is upon their heart, right? They can't see. They have eyes, but they see not. They have ears, but hear not. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, when they shall be born of the Spirit of God, when they shall believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the veil shall be taken away. So it stands to reason, doesn't it? That those who are not saved cannot understand the scripture. That's the beauty of the Bible. Is that it is written in such a way that only those of us with eyes to see can see it. And we can see it clearly. These guys, they don't have any idea whatsoever. In fact... I don't think they even know what they're saying. Because if you just take a step back and consider what he's saying, he is saying that the Antichrist is Jesus. And that the Antichrist will be cut off, not for himself, right? And that he shall confirm the covenant. This is he's thinking of this in terms of the Antichrist. The Antichrist will confirm a covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, the Antichrist will cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Well, Jesus is the one and the only one that can cause the sacrifice to cease and he caused it 
when he laid down his life as the perfect offering, the perfect sacrifice to God once and for all. What is that verse here? Let me see if I can find it. Somewhere in the Bible it says... Oh, oh no, I got it. I gotta hold your horses there. I'm gonna end it on this. <laughs> That's interesting. By the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So no more do we go up year by year or, or week by week or whatever, day by day. We don't make uh, offerings and sacrifices to God anymore because Jesus Christ is the sacrifice the only worthy sacrifice that will cover our transgressions he's the only one the Antichrist can't do it he won't do it and you know I, I could spend another hour showing you that clearly the Antichrist is the Roman Empire and the king of the Roman Empire is the Pope in Rome. All right. But if anybody has any questions that anybody wants me to go through that, I will try to keep it as short as possible. But I hope somebody can see this, that these guys aren't preaching Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. They're preaching Jesus Antichrist. Think about it. 